A long time ago, in the middle of the night, there was this lady who, um, on the side of the road, underneath a lamppost, was looking down as if she was looking for something. And this man who was walking by at this time saw her and asked, did you lose something? She said, yeah, actually, I was here earlier during the day walking down this road, and somewhere along the line, I dropped my bracelet. So the man asked, do you know where you were along the road when you dropped your bracelet? And she said, no, I have no idea. So then he asked, then why do you keep looking in the same spot? You haven't moved at all. And she replied by saying, this is the only spot on the road that has light. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, my name is Hussein, and I am a software developer. And one of the problems that we're trying to solve every day at work is how to better the communication between the business analysts and the software developers. You see, we spend so much time and energy on finding and fixing bugs in our software, and we found that the majority of the bugs are actually due to communication problems and not technical problems. You can see here this one business analyst trying to describe how this one website should look, and the, web, and the developer has a total different idea. And so um, one of the things, a bunch of developers actually got together a few years ago at what they call the Agile Alliance, and they came up with a series of methodologies which basically focus on communication. For example, they would say interactions and individuals should come before processes and tools. Customer collaboration over contracts, and not to rely so much on documentation. So to give you an example, let's say a company spends six months just writing documentation on the software should be like this, these are the business requirements, this is the um, programming language, language we should use, these are the tools we should use, and then they spend another six months coding it up, and then after a year they show it to their client for the first time, and the customer says, this is not what we wanted. So instead, Agile says, well, have a conversation about what you do know, develop that, have another conversation with the customer, show them what you have so far, and then keep building upon that. So in terms of communication, some research has been done as to different levels and effect effectiveness of communication channels. And you can see at the bottom is documentation, and with the use of technology, the effectiveness increases, but the most effective is actually face-to-face -face conversations. So I was on a project a couple years ago where we all sat together, no cubicles, no walls, and in fact, our customers actually sent representatives to sit right next to us for the whole three years of the project. And you can see how powerful this can be. Me as a developer, if I had a question about a business requirement, I could just turn my head and say, hey, Steve, what did you mean by this? And he can explain, and then I can develop it, I can check it in, then show it to him right away, and he can turn to me and say, Hussein, you're the best developer in the world. That was awesome. <laughs> so the challenge that comes in is on a project that I'm on right now, actually, half of our team is in Austin, Texas. And they're actually the headquarters office. We're the secondary office. And so we use technology quite a bit. But what we also do is we send ambassadors. And it's working quite effectively, but I think the Ambassadors that we have found to be the most successful are those who, when they come to our office, they actually spend the first couple weeks just listening, just learning, and focusing their energy on commonalities between the two teams. Then once a common language has been set, once trust has been set, then they focus on differences and how to make things better. So now, I ask myself, are there other aspects of life where we can take these principles and apply them? where communication is key? Well, I think the most obvious one is personal relationships. Here we have a young couple dreaming about their future. The girl is dreaming about the two of them and their two lovely kids, and the guy is dreaming about the two of them and their three lovely friends. So here's a, here's a conversation that needs to happen now before it's too late. And I think even worse is sometimes two people in a relationship or two people in a friendship, a lot of times, sometimes they actually have, they're thinking the same thing, feeling the same thing, but they're unable to communicate it. And they end up thinking that they're disagreeing. I also think this is a reason why long distance relationships are sometimes more challenging because communication is harder. There's less face-to-face -face conversations. So 
And that was here where we challenge ourselves. And I ask, can we take these same principles about communication being used to actually avoid conflict in the future or avoid misunderstandings, and can we apply it at a much larger scale? What about between regions, relationships between countries, relationships between civilizations? And if we did see this correlation, the one relationship which I think we should take a shot at is the one we're reminded about every day when we turn on the news. The relationship which has been shaping our world events for the last decade. And that's the relationship between the Western world and Islam. Or what some would say, Western civilizations and Muslim civilizations. Now some say this is the reason for the conflict, that we have no relationship, we have nothing in common. However, others will say that it's more like this, that we actually have quite a bit in common the problem is that we just don't know enough about each other. We just don't know about those commonalities. And I think the one individual who's been the strongest proponent of this has been His Highness the Aga Khan, who has said that, yeah, some people might call it a clash of, clash of civilizations, but I think that it is a clash of ignorances. We focus so much energy in talking about this conflict, but not enough in trying to avoid it by just learning more about one another, by trying to fill that gap. Now, if we did see the correlation from the previous two examples and with this example, and if we did decide that it's about time that we did do something to try to nurture this relationship, which I think it is about time, then the next question is, what can we do? Or what is being done? Well, there's two ideas which His Highness the Khan actually presented in which he's working on. One of them is education. He has said, imagine we lived in a world where students from Dhaka, from New York, and from Istanbul, when studying literature, all learned about the Bangladeshi poet Tagore, the American novelist Toni Morrison, and the Turkish novelist Orhan Pamuk. Imagine if students in Karachi knew as much about the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as students in Atlanta knew about Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. Imagine if science students all over the world all learned about Ibn al-Haytham, the founder of modern optics, as well as Euclid, whose, challenges, whose ideas he challenged. To me, this is a profound thought. If this was successful, then maybe, just maybe, when people hear someone up on a podium or up on the news saying, the West is like this, or Muslims are like this, maybe they'll think twice and say, well, that scientist I just learned about today in class it didn't seem like he was that bad. What else? What else do we have in common? Well, how about art? Any civilization from any period of the world, any era, from any faith, has always had an appreciation of art. I don't think we realize we have all that in common. So once again, the largest collection of Islamic art in, this, in the English-speaking world is actually going to be housed in a museum in Toronto. And the purpose of the museum, one of the purposes, is to do exactly this, to bring to light some more commonalities between civilizations. Now just like that, we have found two things in common. So what other channels have been successful in this attempt? How about channel six? To me, this initiative of CBC, Little Mosque on the Prairie, was a great initiative. They chose comedy. Now, I've been fortunate in being able to travel to many parts of the world, including Muslim countries, and believe me, there's no one who doesn't appreciate some innocent comedy. There's no one who doesn't like to laugh. And they used comedy to actually try to dismay certain stereotypes. How about some local initiatives? Well, I think everyone here and everyone watching will appreciate the fact that TED Talks and TEDx have been absolute great avenues for people all around the world to learn more about one another. This other one in the bottom left, the One Love Concert, was a Calgary 2012 initiative that I attended at the Jubilee um, at Jack Singer. And it was amazing. They brought together faith groups and community groups from all over Calgary around music. 
and it was a beautiful concert. The top two organizations are two youth groups, Mosaic and Civic, which are Muslim youth groups and which volunteer in the larger, larger society here in Calgary. In fact, just last Sunday, they had a joint venture with the city where they had a river cleanup at Edworthy Park. Now, the driving force behind their work is their faith, but it also doesn't hurt to have people look twice at them and say, these are Muslim kids. Now, if we go back to this chart, we can rely upon institutions, we can rely upon media, but the most effective is supposed to be face-to-face -face communication. And I think in this situation, it should be a two-way conversation, but I find myself lucky in this situation where I'm born and brought up here in Canada, have a deep appreciation for Canadian values, and I also happen to be Muslim. Now, see, that's the best part about the situation we're in here. This relationship that we're trying to nurture, this team that we're trying to build, is not a long-distance relationship. It's not a remote team. And the reason is simple. We live in a country which has been generous in accepting people from all different faiths, from all different parts of the world, and has been successful in celebrating pluralism within our own country. Now, I do think this is a two-way conversation, but I would like to take, do my part and just take the last few minutes and tell you a little bit about what I know about Islam. There are over 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, which means they come from a large spectrum of cultures, of interpretations. However, I think sometimes we associate all Muslims with one culture. We think that Islam only has one culture. And sometimes when something happens in a region of the world that has a lot of Muslims, we automatically associate that with Islam. But we don't do it very consistently. For example, if you take India, India has over 180 million Muslims in it, which means that there are more Muslims in India, twice as many Muslims in India, than any African, Persian, or Arab country. Yet, we don't associate Islam with India's great IT industry, their beautiful music, their delicious butter chicken. <laughs> We're wiser. We know that there are multiple forces at play which influence these things. Two things that all Muslims do have in common. One is belief in one God, and the other is belief and love for the last prophet of Islam, Muhammad. Peace be upon him and and the reason why we say last prophet is because Islam actually believes in many prophets before him, including Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Peace be upon all of them. Now, when I think about the prophet, I think about his life. He had an extremely tragic life from a very young age. In fact, even before his childhood, both his parents had passed away. Yet, through all that, he always kept steadfast to his good nature and patience. In fact, he was known as Al-Amin, which means the trustworthy. He was known for always being honest, always being caring, friendly, and smiling. They said you would always see him with a smile on his face. When he started to receive revelations and was asked to share them, much of his city actually turned their backs on him and his family, and they were oppressed and actually had to leave, for he was asking them to change their way of life. Now, if you ever read up about pre-Islamic Arabia, there were many horrible things that were going on which the Prophet was asking them to stop. He was asking them to put aside their tribal differences and their grudges of the past and come together as one united and equal community. He was asking them to give rights to women. Now, in pre-Islamic Arabia, there was actually a practice where some families used to bury their newborn daughters because they only wanted sons. Not only did he ask them to stop that, he was also asking them to give rights to women. The first time of having rights of inheritance, rights to agree or disagree to marriage. He even once said to a group of male followers that the kindest amongst you, sorry, the greatest amongst you, is he who is kindest to your wife. The prophet used to encourage people to plant trees, to provide water for stray animals. 
And he sanctioned off parts of the environment and said that we should not build here, we should leave this natural. Now I know today many of us will think that these are common sense ideas, but back then in that society they were quite revolutionary and many people did not want to accept them at first. Eventually he won over the hearts of almost everyone around him, but it took time. I remember this one account of the prophet, every time he used to walk down this one road, this old lady who lived on the, that road would make an effort of throwing out her garbage at that time and on the prophet. And every time, he did, every time she did so, he would continue walking, keeping his patience, not saying anything. One day he walked down that road and there was no lady. Now unlike many of us, including myself, who would be quite happy, he actually was worried, stopped on his tracks, turned and asked the neighbor, where is she today? The neighbor said she's been ill for a few days. So the prophet went into her house, saw her on her bed, coughing and sick with no water around her, went and filled a cup of water and placed it next to her bedside. The lady felt a little ashamed, she apologized and he forgave her. Now these values, which I know Islam for, these values of friendliness, generosity, forgiveness, respect, responsibility, are these not the same values that we strive for here in the West every day? Is that not what we all have in common? And it's because I know these values that when I see certain events happening around the world which are being attributed to Islam, I'm able to say with confidence that that's not Islam. Maybe it's culture, maybe it's politics, maybe it's oil, maybe it's Islam being twisted and misused, but it's not the faith itself. I'd like to know, now go back to the story that I started with. To me, this story is full of metaphors. The lady is a metaphor for all of us, each one of us. The road, a metaphor for this world. And this bracelet that she's looking for represents knowledge. And that one light represents the easiest way for us to find information which unfortunately a lot of times happens to be either media or stereotype and is not representative of the truth. In a country like Canada, it is entirely possible for us to light up the rest of the road just by getting to know more about one another. Thank you.